One last time, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Excellent. That is more like it. My name is Larry Midowo. I'm excited to be here this morning as your moderator. And this place is so incredible. And I want to thank the IHUB for having us and to the managing director, Mary Gisharu. We're really excited that this commission on technology and inclusive development is being launched here at the epicenter of all that's innovative and all that's exciting in Africa, yeah. right? Excellent. No. Even though a lot of you are not feeling that, no. we're going to try and do that one more time. Anyway, oh, wow. I'd like right now to invite to the stage the commissioners for Pathways to Prosperity. Please put your hands together for Shivani Siroya, founder and CEO of TALA, <laughs> Stefan Dakin, academic director of the commission, Melinda Gates, co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Nadim Makarim, founder and CEO of Gojek, Strive Masiyewa, founder and executive chairman of Econet, Her Excellency Sri Mulyani Indrawati, Minister of Finance for Indonesia, Kamal Bhattacharya, CIO of Safaricom, and last but not least, Ben Ondulu, academic director of the commission. Everybody's just going to squeeze in a little so we can take a good picture. Benno, everybody, um, slide into everybody's space just for a second so we can all take a good, nice family picture. Give you a good side. So many cameras in the room. <laughs> one more time, we're going to take one last round of pictures again, give you other good side. <laughs> All right, great. Smiles, wide smiles. This is Africa. We smile very widely. <laughs> See, everybody agrees the smiling is. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. Please have your seats. And before we get started, I just want to say that we have a fantastic audience right here in the iHub. But also, we are getting this streamed live on NTV and around the world. And we want to tell you that please be part of the conversation on two hashtags, Pathways for Prosperity, that Pathways with the four, the numeral, and Tech for Dev. Again, that's for the numeral. So one more time, Pathways for Prosperity and Tech for Dev. Thank you all so much for taking time to speak to us this morning. And I want to just jump straight into it. So, Stefan and Benno, you're the academic directors of this commission, and I want to start right at the top. Why does the world need this commission, and what will it do? Stefan. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's really exciting to be here and to be part of this uh, launch. You know, why commission? Well, you know, there's a world, there's a lot of um, technological change going on. There's a lot of talk about all kinds of emerging technologies. But actually, one of the things is, is that a lot of that conversation is taking place very much in rich countries, in developed countries. It's about their jobs and their worries and so on. And what we want to do very much is, in the first instance, making sure that developing countries are at the center of this discussion. Developing countries are the future. They are the emerging countries. They are the ones where the young people are, and we want to make, be able to engage. But these are also countries that still have a long way to go in terms of their own pathways to prosperity. And indeed, within the countries, there's still huge challenges of inclusion. So what we want to work on is to actually see how can we you know, harness technologies for, for the good of the world, for the good of these people, and make them part of the global community uh, as, as equal partners within it, and make sure we can do this, and at the same time, recognize that there are important challenges here. You know, there are fears about technologies, there are fears about maybe job discussion, there are fears about, you know, how should it be regulated, how should it be handled, and just we want to make sure we, we constructively have a dialogue with all the people involved, you know, globally, nationally, civil society business, about, you know, how to maybe better think about it, bring new ideas, and actually provide seats of change for, for action around us. All right, I want to follow up on that in a moment, but I also want to bring in Benno. You're a former central bank governor of Tanzania, so you've been in the front line of applying technology and economic reform. How have you seen technology used in promoting development and also poverty reduction in your experience from Tanzania? Well, by far the most significant uh, success that uh, we have had with technology is the use of uh, ICT and FinTech in uh, bringing financial services uh, to majority of those that were previously unreached. Um, we have seen a huge um, uh, growth uh, of access. Uh, 50 years ago, we were at around 9%. 
uh, with access to uh, financial services close to them. Uh, almost uh, in 2012, we were at around 29. But with the use of this technology, between 2012 and 2017, we went all the way up to 86%. Uh, and that is in a span, a very short span. Usage, likewise, we went from 9% uh, in 2006 to 65.3%. Uh, now, what it has done is really to create a platform for delivering services in remote areas. We have seen uh, closure of gender gap. We have seen closure of rural urban gap, uh, all within less than a decade. And that, I think, for us, is remarkable and gives us hope that we can leapfrog. So while I've still got you, what are the challenges and the opportunities that this commission will seek to address? Well, um, uh, the biggest set of challenges, uh, of course, relate to what uh, is technology going to do uh, to jobs, if they're going to destroy jobs, uh, or uh, if uh, jobs are going to move geographically, uh, reshoring uh, back into developed countries. Uh, but the opportunities are precisely the ability uh, for developing countries to leapfrog with this new technology. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, not only uh, create more jobs uh, within these countries, but more particularly uh, jobs for those that are at the poorest uh, bottom 20%. And I think uh, the other opportunity is to enhance uh, the quality of engagement between government and its citizens by availing information much more effectively uh, to uh, citizens and giving opportunity uh, really to exercise uh, the typical rule, uh, no taxation without a representation. And this comes to everybody uh, right there in the handheld uh, instrument. Right. It's very important, Stefan, that we set the proper background for what the discussion will be. So same question. What are the challenges and the opportunities that this commission will be addressing? Right. So I, to, to build on what, 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 Chanta, uh, what uh, Benno is saying is that, um, you know, the kind of the challenges that we are, are, are facing, you know, I would actually say in the first instance, there's a lot of fear around. And actually, you know, as a guidance for public policy making, that's a really bad principle. It doesn't mean that there could be genuine concerns, but if we are fearful, we were going to do bad policy. And that's actually an important part of it. So, so the kind of challenges is to actually making sure we be very evidence-based in trying to document, you know, what is this story about job destruction or reshoring? What is this story about, you know, the difficulties to get some of these things going? What is this problem about data that may be now suddenly be owned by people? And to be very clear about it. I think that's an important part. And that's a good basis to actually say, let's look at the opportunities. Because the amazing thing is, and again, the fintech is this amazing, amazing thing. You know, you deliver financial services in this country at a fraction of the cost at which financial services are being offered in, say, Brazil or in other countries, let alone in developed countries. But it's an important part. You've been able to do this with this technology that brings down the cost. And that then allows, because it becomes so much cheaper, a lot of people to actually take part in financial services and basically being included. And that's the great thing. You create markets at the same time while you bring these costs down. Now that's the kind of thing we want to look at. Can we do that in other technologies or building on these platforms and do more? You know, that's the great opportunities. Can we move into other parts? Now at the same time, you know, think of it even globally. The opportunity, if all these communication costs globally are brought down, thanks to all the kind of technological improvements. Right. You know, there's certain things we can start doing here, providing services to the world, moving into value chains. Maybe some robots will in 15, 20 years doing the textile and the garment production. But meanwhile, we'll be servicing all the businesses in the, in the developed world. We'll be servicing and all kinds of things, even the social service in the developing world. So these are amazing things. And then I would say quickly, an important part is that the same thing we can do in business, we can do in delivering of services for poor people, service delivery by government, 
getting people better nutrition, better health, better education, and see what we can do there. That's another opportunity. And let us say, improving the quality of government. Okay. An important part here is the governance can be so much more improved. You know, there's amazing examples of how we can fight corruption by using technology to actually getting much more transparent government. All right. So Melinda, uh, Benno and Stefan have both talked about the work in financial inclusion, especially in this in Kenya, in Tanzania, and, and around the region, has been impressive. But why did the foundation choose to fund this commission, and what motivated you to be personally involved? Well, because. You know, I go to so many forums and places in the world where the discussion about technology is technology, to be honest, for high and middle income countries. The creation of jobs, the destruction of jobs, AI, where it's going to go, how it's going to be life threatening. And yet, when Bill and I travel all over the world, and, you know, I've just come from the Sahel, my fifth, tra my fifth trip to the Sahel, um, I see this potential. Technology is just technology, it's whatever you do with it that that changes things. I see the potential of the quality of life getting better for so many people on this planet. No matter whether they live in a remote village in Niger, or whether they live in the heart of Nairobi, or in the heart of Jakarta, or they live in Beijing, or they live in London. And yet, I think if we don't have an inclusive discussion that brings all voices forward and ideas from all over the world, not just Silicon Valley or Beijing or Nairobi, thank goodness, there's an iHub here, it's amazing, right? Um, but how do we get voices from all over the world in this discussion so that we reach everybody, we reach that vegetable grower who's growing things on our farm and taking them to market as well as the university student. And I think we can use technology in amazing ways to improve people's quality of life, but it has to be an inclusive discussion and I think by doing that, we can set some of the right policies and regulations. We can open things up so more entrepreneurs flood in from all over Africa, all over the Southeast Asia, and we can make it inclusive of everybody. And that means the poor and men and women equally. All right, I'll come back to that because you describe yourself as an uh, in, impatient um, optimist. optimist. I'll come back to what that means and why this is important. But Strive, you're an entrepreneur and a philanthropist whose work around um, Technological innovation is in impressive. And as you travel around the continent, but also in other parts of the world, what do you see as the technologies that are likely to be changing the lives of Africans in this modern time? Well, first of all, it's great to be in Nairobi, uh, the home of Impesa. I, ha I have a problem with that because, you know, it's a competitor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's there are hundreds of impessas waiting to be uncovered. And we shouldn't stumble into the great technologies that will help people. I don't think that it's, it's an issue of what technologies will affect our people. Every technology will affect our people. And it, what is important is that we, we know we're not separated from the rest of the world. Uh, we're very much part of that world. And technology is diffusing today much quicker than at any time in history. I think for, for me personally, uh, what, is in, what is creating an, uh, an urgency is this realization that we have extraordinary new technologies coming through. What we've seen with mobile communications, uh, fintech to date is nothing compared to what's coming through. The impact of technologies like artificial intelligence are going to be so profound they can dislocate it, even our political systems, let alone the opportunities for the weakest in our societies. So it's important that we engage quickly to understand without fear what this means. And that's why it's important that we become part of the voices that are discussing these things, as Melinda was saying. Uh, these things shouldn't happen out there, and we sit out here waiting for some wave to come and hit us, and maybe something happens in between. No, that's not the way it should be. So it's, uh, I think it's extraordinary that we have this opportunity. The other thing I wanted to point out is that 
we're on a continent where the average age is 19. 65% of our people were not even born when I was running around trying to build mobile phone networks. Just think about that, okay? And as these technologies are coming through that are far greater than what we saw before, how do we create jobs? How do we create jobs without having our kids cross the Sahara and the Mediterranean? How do we create jobs so that we do not have uh, extremist groups that completely disrupt our societies? So this is why there's an urgency. We, we need to mobilize everybody to participate in a conversation about how we take advantage for our benefit of these changes and build resilience where we cannot uh, take advantage. I want to come back on what governments can do to um, make your work easy in the private sector, but I want to start with the uh, Minister Indrawati because you've been finance minister in Indonesia for a long time. I wonder how technology has affected the challenges, the opportunities that you encounter while trying to promote development. Well, we choose to say that technology is more an opportunity rather than a challenge. Uh, I think in Indonesia, we can see it, it can improve the productivity. I hear with Nadim, which is actually invented Gojek, a share riding, which is reducing transaction costs, improving the quality of life of many people, and creating job 1.5 million people as a rider and merchant who's actually connecting in this platform. So it is an opportunity. As a finance minister, we actually look at many of uh, dimension of how this technology can improve the policy and the effectiveness in delivering results for the people. Let's say Indonesia spent 20% of our budget on education. But the level of satisfaction of the people is not really high and appreciated. So it is not a problem of money, it's about service delivery. So there is a platform invented by a young people in Indonesia, we call it the Ruang Guru, is that a room for teacher. They actually try to scale up the most effective teacher so that it can be massively accessed by the student who is not unfortunate to have a good teacher in their remote area. So Service delivery is going to be very important. We spend 5% of our budget on uh, health. But then, Indonesia is a big country, 257 million, and a lot of 100,000 islands. So how are we are going to reach out to them? The third is actually how we can use the technology, especially data and information technology, for us to be able to better target to the poor. Because we have a social safety net program, social protection. In the past, we provide for the poor family a cash transfer. If we know the name and the address, we can have and provide them with the account, banking account, so we can transfer directly to the Melinda Mansion and very important to use a woman account so that we actually pay it for the woman in this case rather than for a, a male uh, household in order for them to actually use it to improve the education of their children or have an access of the health. So this can be a combination of technology, data, and fintechs that can have a much better targeting and have a really payment system which is much lower cost on the bureaucratic side. The third, as a finance, uh, this is my favorite one in Indonesia, I use the media, social media and technology information is actually to communicate about our budget. Because I really want the people of Indonesia to own the budget. They understand how much money we collect, how much we spend for what, where, so that they actually have not only ownership, they can control. The biggest problem is always governance and corruption. By telling them that actually Indonesia spent more than 400 trillion rupiah for infrastructure, then people will know why I'm not enjoying anything from this kind of spending. So we use this technology to create accountability, transparency, and citizen engagement so that they getting more excited and understand about the budget and then they are going to then support on many sometimes difficult reform that we have to do. For example, if we are going to address the issue of fuel subsidy, 
Is this subsidy really right to address the poverty in Indonesia? Is there any choices? Can you say how we are going to deal with that? And that kind of interaction is much faster and effective rather than in the past when we don't have this kind of technology. So for policymakers, this is really a real opportunity for us to use technology to improve the quality of policy and institution. Great. That takes me back to Melinda, what I was saying about you describe yourself as an impatient optimist. You want to lift more people out of poverty, but faster. So why is this commission a good way to do that? Yeah. So uh, the, one of the reasons I'm an impatient optimist is if you look back over the last 20 years and you look at just human life expectancy and the growth in that, how long people are living and with a quality of life, if you look at childhood deaths, We've cut them basically in half, that is children who die under the age of five in the last 20 years. So life is improving around the planet and I'm optimistic that we can make it better, but I'm also impatient because I travel to places in remote places in Kenya or Tanzania and I see that life isn't yet good enough for people and yet it could be so much better. And so when I think about this commission, I think about how do we take that technology, whether it's FinTech, all the way out to the last remote mile. When I, I'm in some of these remote villages and you hear a cell phone ringing just when you don't expect it to. And I talk to women. I've been visiting um, self-help groups now for a, well over a decade in India and in Africa and many places. And women are very creative. So they'll tell you the difference when they can save together. They then have money for a health shock or when it's time for the school fees due. But they often save in a group and the way they used to deal with the security issue is they had a lockbox and they had a code on it. And you might get two digits of the pin and you get two digits and I get two digits. So when mobile phones came out and they finally had a mobile phone in their hand, they couldn't afford one for everybody in the group, but they had one for the entire group. Guess what? You got a few digits of the pin and you did and I did. And they had a secure account then that they saved their money in. Then eventually in Kenya, they could hook up to the banking services and eventually they could each get their own account and eventually they could get insurance and eventually they'll get crop information. When their crop comes due at market, here's the market price so the middleman doesn't take them. Here's the disease I've got on the leaf of my plant. Eventually they'll have a smartphone so they'll be able to say, well, that's what I've got. Where do I go for services to get rid myself of that disease? Women and men in these villages will tell you the difference that information and a bank account makes. And just to give you one final example on the bank account uh, front, uh, India, which is now putting, it's, it's had the steepest rise in bank account ownership and usage in the last 18 months of anywhere else on the planet. They got their policy and the regulations right. They have a digital ID system. But when the government started putting the government payments through that system, they took billions of dollars of graft out of the system, so it saves government money. But when women had their own account, they entered then the formal economy instead of the informal, and they, were, they had 25% more yearly income just because they entered the formal, the formal payment structure. And so the formal economy. And so what that does, we know when women enter the formal economy and when they have a job and when they have income, you create empowerment for women. And they will tell you all of a sudden they have different voice in their community, in their family, their mother-in-law looks at them differently, their son who they bought a motorbike for, their husband looks at them differently. So you change the structure of society. And that is the power of technology if done right. All right, I'm, I'm fascinated by just how energetic you all are about this because the UN projects that by 2030, still something like 800 million people around the world will still be in extreme poverty. Half of these will just be in Africa. So it seems that the challenge is insurmountable. It's huge. I don't know who, wanna, who wants to take that, Melinda. Well, <laughs> uh, no pressure. <laughs> um, I can't say I can solve it for everybody, and certainly not alone. But I think it's when you get all the pieces working together. You get government, you get civil society, you get NGOs, you get entrepreneurs all working on behalf of the world. And you start to do the right things. I go out in remote places today where there's still piles of paper registries, where we register kids' vaccines, or we register women for their antenatal visits. You know, I, I, but yet I think about what we do of our own health in the United States, where I can get all my health data on my phone, but, and I've worn a Fitbit overnight, and I know a lot, you know, about my own health. And so eventually, when we can get mobile phones out there and get smart 
smartphones out there in equal measure, the way people will be able to prevent their own disease, the way we'll be able to do and are doing disease modeling around the world. We've lived with malaria since the time of the Egyptians around the world. And guess what? It's coming back to places because of climate change. We have not eliminated nor eradicated it yet from the world, eliminated in certain places. But we're learning about these local elimination and the pressures on the mosquitoes because of people's cell phone patterns of where they're moving and getting it. So we can do disease modeling for one of the biggest uh, killers of adult, the adult population, and eventually we'll be able to eradicate that disease, also with advances in biotechnology. So I think there's huge promise if we put it to the advances of not just the high-income countries, but in advance of the low-income countries too, and we keep them also on the front of the agenda. Right, um, any of you can jump in, but I wanted to bring in Strive here, because as an entrepreneur, what are the conditions that are necessary for private sector innovation that also does good in the world, and what can governments do to make sure they're creating that environment? You know, just to, to pick up on, on your earlier comment yes. 800 about million 800 million people, and it, it should concern us deeply, particularly here in Africa. We've made extraordinary progress in the last 20 years. You know, we cannot take that away. Uh, we are seeing 5% uh, annual growth compounded now for some 20 years. And some of our economies, as you know, are riding out at 7 8%. Kenya is one of them. But the truth is that, that our growth is not inclusive. And it's leaving a lot of people out. Our, whilst the poverty rate has fallen across the world, as Melinda noted, uh, ours has been stubborn. Our rate is not falling the way it should. And this has major implication for our society. Um, as entrepreneurs, we are part of the solution. We're not the solution, but we have to look to our entrepreneurs as part of that solution. Uh, whether it was M-Pesa or the, or the, the Ushaidi and other things, they came out of entrepreneurs, okay? So what we need to do is to create an ecosystem that runs all the way from government. I'm seeing my good friend, the minister of ICT here, all the way from the presidency to the government, in the government, to frame policies that create an ecosystem where entrepreneurs are given the support they need quickly as partners in development, including creating venture capital. Our venture, we will not get very far with venture capital coming to Africa from Silicon Valley. We have pools of resources here in Africa if we create the right incentives. The very same places the venture capitalists in America get their money. You know what? We've got pension funds here too. Uh, we've got annuity schemes here too, where if we create the right incentives, we can begin to create African venture capitalists who support entrepreneurs on the ground. But they will require incentives the entrepreneurs themselves need support. We need to open our markets, constantly deregulate. Deregulation must be a continuous process because our propensity is to regulate. Right. So we've got to counterintuitively deregulate. So, so those are some of the things we need to be doing uh, to take ourselves forward. I said Stefan wants to jump in really quickly. <laughs> Why isn't there a, a bigger African VC market, now that you mentioned that? So, simply because we haven't put the ecosystem in place. If Silicon Valley just didn't happen. I remember going to Silicon Valley 1991 right. and seeing what state governments and local authorities were doing. These kind of hubs were already being built back then. Now look, they got Google. I went to China back 10 years ago. And they were beginning to do the same. Now look, they got Alibaba. Guess what? We've got to do the same. Right. That's how we're going to do it. And we've got to do it across the entire continent. Great, Stefan. Well, now we just also this ecosystem and, and also the role of public policy without it. Because you know, the challenge in Africa is, 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 is really serious. You know, this, um, 
But one of the great things about the technology is that we'll have another degree of freedom. You know, we have, we have another set of things we can use, but using it well, you know, in a history, in a lot on the continent, where we haven't used the previous opportunities well for exactly the reason that this drive is describing. Let's not underestimate this, you know. We will need to get our business climate right, very important. We'll need to get our education right. There's still, you know, we may have all the mobile phones, but our children are often not learning in African schools. Mm. We may uh, want to do all kinds of things to do with, uh, with technology, but we have actually failed our investment in energy in a proper way. You know, these kind of building blocks will be essential as well, and more so to grab the opportunity. So it is not about, oh, well, we can forget about all the things that we need to get right. It's actually reinforcing that we need to get these things right and take advantage. But we have more degrees of freedoms with all these technologies and what that kind of, it, that kind of entrepreneurship that Strive is describing. But grabbing that opportunity is a real big policy thing. I mean, think in Kenya for a second. You know, we are here and at, uh, talking about, you know, the, the big four in terms of the plan that one wants to do. But just think of it, you know, manufacturing industrialization, key important. But in a changing world, it has to be really dynamic. It can't be 1960s type of manufacturing that needs to come back. Health and education, uh, food security, nutrition, urbanization, it needs to be done well to be able to take advantage of all these opportunities. Great. But if I can say yes, yes, something Minister. about this poverty, I mean, the progress of reducing poverty in the world is mostly contributed by the East Asia uh, in their policy, who actually open enough the regulation uh, that Strife mentioned earlier, but also their ability to transform from basically primary uh, economic uh, system into a much more manufacturing base and services base. And this is also investment on a human capital and right policy openness export oriented, providing them with all this innovation and interaction through the FDI with the global world. And this is exactly maybe what we need to address. The world now facing with 800 million uh, poverty. Yes. But for many part of the world, this is becoming a harder issue because we are dealing with the core poverty, the real bottom 20%, which is maybe cannot be addressed unless it is not only requiring the right policy, but we should use the technology to accelerate this kind of poverty reduction. And we've already shown in many different experiences that technology can really address this last mile problem, whether on a service delivery to the data system, better targeted, and improving in terms of the governance. Right. Uh, because many of what you call it, serving the poor, this is the weakest part of many of the government in the world. And I do hope that with this technology, I think many countries in the world can learn faster on addressing this issue. But you're familiar with this, based on your background at the World Bank and then now as finance minister. For policymakers in the developing world, you have so many pressing concerns, whether it's yeah. unemployment or the rule of law, just, just too many issues. Mm -hmm. How does technology play in this sea of priorities? Well. That's why you have a cabinet, and that's why you have uh, those who's addressing the issue of governor, uh, gover governance, uh, law enforcement, those who's dealing with the education and health. Basically, many of the country always say that we have a lot of priority. Right. That's why they are elected and they have to deliver that to the people. But the difference from country to country in responding to this kind of all in, uh, in, uh, very pressing issue is how they are going to put the right policy and build the institution, which is allowing the solution to happen. Because sometimes the policymakers become part of the problem rather than bringing a solution. Mm -hmm. With a bad policy, with protecting bureaucracy, or in this case, protecting the economy for what they call it competition, which is then creating more inefficiency, not to mention corruption in this case. So for a country, the priority will be set according to what is the political promise that they are having. But what is different is how you are going to invite more idea in order for you to be open enough. For example, what I mentioned about the budget. Yes. Many countries in the world is not even transparent on the budget. And this is something which is easier to, done, to, to actually do it by uploading your data on a budget so that you are going to have more control from your own people about 
this transparency. And in terms of support, many countries, especially poor countries, actually receiving quite a lot of support. And that the question, are they crowding out their own effort? Because without your own ownership, you cannot invite Melinda Gate to solve a problem. At the end, it is your government who should really build the institution, build the system for the service delivery. Then the philanthropists can come and give more better idea, accelerate those kind of effort. But it is not a substitute okay. for your own government uh, effort in this case. So again, I think policy and institution is very important. Accountability and transparency is important. And with this technology, it actually can help those process faster. All right, great. Benno, you've talked about wicked problems um, in development. I wonder what these wicked problems are mm -hmm. and how technology can help, especially poor countries, solve them. Well, we, we, we do have uh, a good number of uh, these wicked uh, uh, problems. I think one of them is uh, essentially being able to uh, reduce corruption. Uh, and we know in order to do that, uh, transparency and accountability is uh, a major instrument. And technology, particularly which provides information to the citizenry, technology that can enable citizens to react to decisions on Twitter and other uh, formats uh, actually does put pressure uh, for good behavior and does put pressure uh, for avoidance of uh, corrupt uh, practices. So you're recommending maybe shaming some of these people because on social media, can, um, the citizens will just be like, this is not acceptable. What about those leaders who have lost the capacity for shame? They oh. will steal from me. <laughs> 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 Nobody loses capacity for shame. It's only a level of resilience. I think they're not, they're not qualified to become a leader. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I jumped in. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, um, I think, I think uh, the, the other problem really in relation to uh, poverty is making sure that uh, we deliver services uh, to the poor, uh, at a cost-effective um, uh, uh, way. Right. And for example, I'll just take an example of our own country. Uh, we have uh, a program on uh, social action fund which uh, provides um, uh, cash transfers uh, to the poorest uh, groups uh, so that they can, as families, help children go to school and give them an opportunity to be able to uh, uh, be self-sustaining. Um, recently, uh, technology has actually enabled uh, significantly to uh, reduce costs of transfers because now they can receive the cash transfer directly uh, on the phone. So cut out the middleman. Yes. Similar to what's happening in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, on education, teacher absenteeism. Typically, it has again been uh, more a problem of uh, teachers having to get to district headquarters to get their salaries. Uh, whatever cash that they get, they have got to spend it all, more or less buying things, and, and probably enjoy themselves for quite almost a week uh, while school is not being attended to. Now teachers are being paid. Uh, straight on, on their phone. They can manage, uh, not only manage their cash better, but they can also spend more time delivering teaching. And right. this is not just for teachers. Health workers in remote areas, uh, similarly. So uh, I think this is definitely uh, uh, making service delivery much, much more effective. 
All right, great. Stefan, we see a lot of commissions launch in the field of development, but also in other fields. What makes this Pathways for, for, for Prosperity Commission different? Well, there's a number of things. I think that the first one would be is that, you know, a resolute focus on, on issues to do with developing countries, a resolute focus on what's happening to the poorest people. Um, but it's also the composition of the kind of people that are involved. We have people from academia like myself. I'm an Oxford professor. Um, but you have people, the practitioners, entrepreneurs, policymakers, and bring them together. Often these are all just usually white gray men that actually are just known to write very fat films and they write another one and put it on the shelf. We want to engage much more. You know, this is about technology, so we want to actively engage uh, in various platforms to bring ideas and to consult and to reach new voices and reach out to get the best ideas, even if it may not always mean that we get total clarity. But this is so important that it needs to be debated. It needs to be new ideas on the, on, on, on the table and get ideas from all over the world on how we can solve particular problems. It has to be, of course, be building on the evidence you know, coming from a university, I come from a public policy school in Oxford, the Vatican School of Government. We try to get as much as we can all the evidence from everywhere together. But we have an incredible dynamic and diverse commission who have bring in so much richness of experience and access to policy making that we want to sow the seeds of change, change in this kind of field. All right. Melinda, in your work, and I guess this also for Strive, you, with your foundation and with philanthropy and what you do, what do you see as the technologies that have the potential for having the most impact in people's lives for the better? Well, I see a lot of possibility in the health sector, for sure. So the way we think about a, a development is we think about health. That is, you have to start with a healthy life to then even be able to go on to get an education and participate in the economy. So unbelievable opportunity in health. Even what we're just learning about the gut microbiome yesterday that's going to apply but when I sit in those academic settings, they're talking about the gut microbiome for, for obesity. But what about for the people who are malnourished? Right. How do we make sure they're at that, represented at that table? So health, education, and then jobs. You get that cycle working for any country, it changes everything. And digital can underlie all of that. Just as Benno said in the education system, knowing that teachers actually show up at their job, uh, making sure they're paid, but that they're high quality. We're seeing amazing augmentation of teaching with uh, computers these days. Or in the creation of jobs, and just as Stry said, let's open up these markets so that you don't just get a few good ideas coming out of a few countries in Africa. Let's unleash the opportunity here of all the amazing entrepreneurs, because they're the ones, the markets will then scale these great ideas. And so we want to make sure that as part of this work, we're thinking about everybody, not just the people in the capital cities who get better service delivery or get their products instead of two-day delivery. It's a two-hour delivery if you're in Beijing. Not just them, but that family living out in the remote rural village. How do we make life better for them? And how can technology underpin them to bring them into that market economy? Do you have any concerns about these emerging technologies? about the emerging technologies? Yes. Sure. I mean, yes, of course, what it can do to governance, what it can do to corruption, what it can do in terms of a terrorist event. You bet. Technology can be used for good or for evil. Right. I, I believe in biotechnology, but there's also bioterrorism, which is another side of it. So society has to always look at those problems and make sure that we're thinking about the risks in there and how we regulate for those or how we plan for those. I mean, one of the big things that Bill and I are behind in the last uh, year with the, the G7 and the G20 nations is a global pandemic response. I mean, we saw Ebola erupt in Africa and immediately it was all over the world, right? If we had the right global pandemic response, which involves technology, we can do disease modeling and you can stop those diseases very quickly at borders. All right, Strav, as you respond to the most transformative technologies, maybe also, what makes you hopeful? And is that something that makes you afraid? Afraid? <laughs> he had to ponder that for a moment. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, as you know, we've been working with uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in Kenya here uh, for the last 10 years. As you know, we, we set up AGRA together, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which we headquartered here in Kenya. 
which has been looking at technologies around agriculture. How do we scale up agricultural production? And more importantly, just as equally as important as that, is the fact that agriculture today in Africa is done firstly by women and elderly women. Increasingly, are far, we are fed by our mothers and our grandmothers, to be honest, and um, young people are not on the farms. Smallholder farmers are producing more and getting less. So we came together 10 years ago to begin to see how this could be uh, dealt with. And you'll recall, I, we were originally led by Kofi Annan, who helped set up that foundation. But that also gave me uh, an appetite in philanthropy to say, you know, there are a lot of things we can do when we come together in partnerships of this nature. So I'm not coming at this without just blindly, but knowing that when we do come together in an evidence-based way to look at issues in, in a very constructive engagement as broadly as we can, there are solutions out there. So the, the real uh, ambition here is to make it even broader. Really bring in voices that have never been brought into these kind of conversations. Because sometimes we get into a rut. Uh, same people discussing the same developmental issues until they are the development experts. Well, no, let's broaden it. Let's bring in young people. Let's have broader conversations. And then on the technological front, for me, it's more about the need the technology will follow. Here's a need that I want to leave us with. Uh, skills. The, the, the greatest, we can embrace any technology that's gonna come through. The real challenge for us will be skills. How do we skill up our, our children to cope with it, to be able to take advantage? How do we skill up today's worker for tomorrow? We can't skill them up for the industries of the 20th, 20th century, let alone the 19th in some cases. We are now in the 21st century. And so we've got to look at even the fabric of our education and be bold enough to say, is it fit for purpose? And how are we going to build schools that A, we've got on this continent 30, 40 million kids that should be in school, that are not in school at all. Well, and they're getting angry. Some of them call themselves Boko Haram. Not a, not a good way to be angry, okay? But we have to respond to those kind of urgencies because that's where extreme voices find root. We've got to deal with education systems where we have kids in school that are not learning or are not learning to be equipped for what we are going to need to do tomorrow. So opportunities, yes, but they're not going to passively come at us. We have now to skill up and to build a learning society that is constantly learning for a constantly changing environment. So that's where I would want to leave it. I wanted to pick up on what you said about technology, but also the skills angle, because we often appear in the global south to be seriously behind the curve. In Africa, I think internet users is about less than 30% of the population. So when other parts of the world are talking about the artificial intelligence or blockchain or the internet of things, we're barely scratching the surface. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, that, and hence the urgency. We've got to, we've got to bring down the cost, we've got to increase the connectivity, right. we've got to make sure that those who are in that core poverty space are, be are becoming included. All right. Minister Indrawati, in your experience, and you've got a fantastic background, what, does the potential, what is the potential of technology to improve governance, and what are the risks, if any? Well, as I said earlier, I think technology with the information technology and the spreading of the information faster I think there is really an opportunity for the government who really want to establish what you call it good governance 
accountability and transparency, you can do it faster and cheaper. Right. I, I, even in this case in Indonesia, I always criticize other ministers who actually spending a lot of budget for advertisement, which is no longer no one want to read. You really have to do it much faster with the technology. So for those who really want to do it in terms of better governance, transparency, accountability, technology definitely can help faster today. The second one is in terms of creating an ownership of the policy. I mean, the government at the end is serving the public. It's not the public who serves the government. And that's why when you are explaining a policy, you can really explain about what is the trade-off, who's going to be the beneficiary of this policy, and also addressing who's going to lose from this policy. Because sometimes, and most of the time, even in this case, in many countries, good policy cannot prevail only because you suffer backlash from those who suffer from this policy. The loser can be very forceful, right. while the winner can be a silent majority in this case. So creating with the technology a debate in a way that then people can see that this policy can benefit more people and that will make your country or economy better and stronger will give a chance for a good policy to actually win the support. The third one, in this case, is actually you create more ownership about the public resources. For finance minister in this case, tax is going to be very important. And for many emerging and developing countries, usually those who pay tax is only the top 5% and they can also easily evade the tax. And with now technology and especially more and more country in the world working together, to address the issue of tax evasion through the automatic exchange of information and beneficiary uh, base erosion profit shifting, we are going to be able to create a much more level playing field for a country to collect tax. And then the revenue from this tax can be spent and people feel that, oh yeah, the government is working for us. Right. This kind of thing will create more legitimacy for the government. And when you have a political legitimacy, you are going to be able to push harder on the reform. Because when you are going to say, I'm going to open market, the people will feel that this is going to be threatening me, threatening a group of people. So when you have a big political legitimacy, you will be able to actually do a much stronger and more ambitious reform, which is sometimes creating a loser on the immediate, but have a much more benefit for the country. And that's why you are going to be able to create political space for this kind of difficult reform. So I see the technology really can improving a lot of the way we work as a government, if the government really want to do it, of course. All right, I'm out of time, but I just want to get from all of you, starting with your minister, what do you hope this commission achieve, uh, will achieve? What will success look like for you? starting with you, because you're, you're all people who are working in different fields, important work. What will success look like for you? Well, this is a very interesting group of people coming from many different backgrounds. The commissioner will provide more value added on the debate and how many countries can learn, okay. especially because my background as a policymaker, many policymakers doesn't know how to respond to this kind of technology change. They worry, but they don't know how to respond. Okay. So with this kind of commissioner, I will say that we are going to get a success if we will be able to actually engage with many policymakers to provide a good information, set of the exchange experience, and then encourage them to adopt a good policy. It will be even better if we are going to provide not only exchange view, but experience and how they are going to actually improve. Okay. Then many of the private sector can learn each other because as I even visit here today, I learn quite a lot from Africa. It's actually adding to what we've already uh, learned before when I was in a, uh, in a World Bank uh, job. So it is a very good, and I do hope that the commissioner can be a different platform in terms of engaging many different stakeholders on this very important uh, issue of technology. All right, Benno, your closing remark real quick. Well, um, two things. One is to generate a good set of ideas that are backed by good, strong evidence, uh, and usually adoption of ideas 
needs conviction, and we need to generate that information for that purpose. Two is uh, peer learning, to facilitate peer learning so that uh, you can take comfort in the fact that uh, your peers have done this and succeeded, that you have a chance to do the same. All right, Stefan, similar to you, what does success look like for you with this commission? Uh, so, you know, it's to echo what Benno is saying, you know, as the only white male on the entire commission, you know, that is very rare that we would have debates like that, as the only Muzungo involved. It's actually quite important that I bring the best evidence to the table, learning from researchers all across um, Africa and Asia, what is actually going on, and learn from the practice that's going on, and see whether we can help policymakers really embrace the opportunity and handle the challenges sensibly. That would be a success for me. And we're grateful to the Blavatnik School and the Gates Foundation for funding this. What will success look like for you, Melinda? Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion that we think about everybody on this planet and how to include them in this digital revolution so that life gets better for them. Great, and lastly, Strive. A call to action. You know, I know great ideas are gonna come through. Of that, I'm really excited because the kind of people that have been brought together. But when all is said and done, it's only as good as our ability to have a call to action, a sense of urgency with some clear-cut outcomes about what we can all do together. I would like to see institutional frameworks that capture the ability to be inclusive and to protect the most vulnerable uh, in our societies. Right. All right, many thanks. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give a big Kenyan thank you to our panelists for such a fantastic conversation. Asante Sana, thank you. You may... Awesome. That is a true Kenyan thank you.